hopefully our PowerPoint doesn't give us any issues today. Um, but welcome, hopefully everyone's doing okay. Uh, today we're talking about, or well this week, we're talking about one and two way independent ANOVAs. Um, I've, I'm trying a new like organization of tests this semester. So usually I would teach like one way ANOVAs and then I would teach two way ANOVAs. But the crossover between the two tests in terms of like the assumptions that you do and the procedures are very similar when you look at like independent ANOVAs versus repeated measures. So we're gonna focus on the independent ones this week and then I'll see if this organization works out okay. Um, but I thought this cat meme was funny, one, because it's a cat meme, but um, also it's like once you grasp the concept of t-tests, then I insert ANOVAs and then you're like, no. <laughs> so that's my meme. I have a couple more memes throughout the PowerPoint. So those are my memes for the week instead of um, doing memes of the week like we usually do. But um, I think they're pretty great. Anyways. Let's look at our decision tree. Um, so this is this is where we're at. Uh, this week we're kind of focusing on these red pathways. So um, we've we've got a good chunk of our tests out of the way so far. Uh, we learned five total for the semester. You guys did four correlations, regressions, and t tests. So what we've got left are our uh, one-way ANOVAs, which are kind of in this section here. And then we have our two-way ANOVAs, which are also referred to as factorial ANOVAs. The main difference between these two is kind of where they break off at the independent variable box. So one-way ANOVAs will have one independent variable. Two-way ANOVAs will have two or more independent variables. Um, well, really, they'll have two but you could also have three-way ANOVAs, you could have four-way ANOVAs. I think the most I've seen in a research article is a four-way, um, which provides a lot of different comparisons. <laughs> it's a little wild. Two ANOVAs, I, or two ways, I feel like is like a good stopping point for this class, just so you can see how they're set up um, and then the different uh, kind of results that you can get out of them. But in each case for one-way and two-way, um, you could have between or within subject independent variables, um, and that will determine the type of ANOVA that you're working with. For this week, we'll, we're just going to be working with between subject factors. So that's where we get our one way and two way independent ANOVAs. Um, so primarily our one way ANOVA here, it's actually referred to as a one way ANOVA in SPSS. For your guys' class, like, I like you to specify it's an independent ANOVA um, versus like a repeated measure, but we'll have a one-way ANOVA or one-way independent ANOVA in this chain of events. And then we'll have our two-way uh, independent ANOVA on um, the factorial ANOVA side. So those are the two we're focusing on. Next week we'll do repeated measures. And then the following week we'll look, or, repeated measure, this one and this one. And then the following week, we'll look at mixed two-way. So it'll be a little bit less content in that last week of instruction. So you can start to think about studying for the last exam. Yay. All right. So um, in a flow chart version of things, just to kind of see how things split up here. Um, We've got a parametric or ratio or interval type dependent variable, just one. Then we also have um, a non-parametric and our, for our class, we're just gonna say all of our um, classifications for independent variables are nominal, just to simplify things. Uh, the number of independent variables, again, is kind of where we get this split between a one-way versus a two-way. So one independent variable, that has at, at least three levels will end up giving us our one-way ANOVAs. So if we have a between subject independent variable, that's an independent one-way ANOVA. And then if we have a within subject factor, that's where we get our repeated measures ANOVA, which again, I grade these out because we're gonna be doing them next week. 
Um, when we only had two levels, that's where we did t-tests. So that's how t-tests and ANOVAs are different from each other. But conceptually speaking, they both look at the same thing, where you're taking different groups of people, you calculate the means of those groups for a dependent variable, and then you compare the means to see if you have an effect of some intervention on the dependent variable measured. Um, we could expand that idea further. And then instead of one independent variable, we could have two or more. Um, for our purposes, we're just gonna focus on two-way ANOVAs. And when we have these, you have to have at least two groups per variable. Um, so maybe you're looking at males and females and a body position in a certain, like maybe like a technique. So you look at two different types of body position, right? Each of those independent variables has at least two levels and that allows us to do a comparison um, between the, the independent variables. The primary goal of a two-way ANOVA is to look at the interaction between two uh, controlled manipulations. So as long as you have two levels, you're good to go, okay? But again, if we have between subject factor, that gives us our two-way independent ANOVA. If we have a within subject factor, we end up with a two-way repeated measures ANOVA. So the flow of things generally kind of works with what we've already been dealing with for t-tests so far. Um, ANOVA just stands for analysis of variance. So I, I, I never say analysis of variance except for this one um, instance for this class. Uh, so ANOVAs, that's what they do. Um, again, we're similar to t-tests, we're looking at cause and effect. So effect is kind of like your keyword when you're writing your interpretations. Um, but the main difference is that from t-tests is that we're looking at difference between three or more means for a one-way ANOVA or looking at the difference between means per independent variable plus an interaction for a two-way ANOVA. Uh, the statistic that we will be assessing, where's my mouse, here it is, um, is the F statistic. So you guys, um, I don't know if anyone paid attention to that uh, when we looked at our regression analyses, because we had an ANOVA table in the regression analysis, um, but also, for the change statistics for the R squared value, there were F statistics that had been calculated in the output. And the F statistic is a measure of, um, it's kind of like a T statistic where we're looking at the difference between means, but it integrates more uh, variance type uh, calculations. So, way, 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 way back at the beginning of the semester when we looked at the calculation of variance as like a, a measure of variability, we had something in the numerator of the variance calculation that was called the sum of squares. And the sum of squares ends up giving us a variance measure, okay? Um, with some other things integrated into that. But that's how the F statistic is generated is by looking at the variance within groups and between groups. And then we can do a, more calculations to then figure out what the, the magnitude of our difference is uh, with respect to this F statistic. So that's what we'll be calculating. I give you guys examples of how to calculate this in the activity this week, but um, if we're looking at the ANOVA table, this is kind of how it breaks down in terms of how things are calculated. Um, so the other thing is that, uh, that I hate um, about SPSS is that the ANOVA tables are not the same for independent ANOVAs versus repeated measures ANOVAs. So for this, this is the setup for um, independent ANOVAs. You'll have a row that's for between group comparisons, and then you'll have another row that's for within group comparisons. Now, these descriptors um, should not be confused with between subject and within subject independent variable factors, which are more along the lines of like how we 
how we sample people. Um, these are going to be based off of how we actually do our calculations. So between groups is going to be looking at the variances between the groups in comparison to if we had all of our groups combined together versus the within group comparison, we'll be looking at differences between subjects in comparison to the mean of their respective group. And I'm pretty sure I left a note in the PowerPoint version for you guys that kind of outlines what that difference is. Um, but the variance that we're calculating in our analysis of variance is in this sum of squares column. So I will always give you guys the sum of squares uh, for both between and within group comparison. So you never have to worry about calculating those. I used to have you guys calculate, or I used to have students calculate them in previous iterations of the class, but I've been working on like cutting out information every semester. And um, this is one of the things that I decided wasn't super necessary. So the thing you do need to know how to calculate is the total of the sum of squares, but that's like an easy one because you just add the two sum of squares together. Um, for degrees of freedom, I have a note down here on what N and K stand for. So N is your total number of subjects between all of your groups combined. So if we had 30 subjects across three groups, we have a total N of 90, right? Um, and then K would be representing the number of groups that you have. So in that example, I just said three groups of 30. So three would be my number of groups. Really, K is just the number of levels of your independent variable, if you also want to think about it that way. Um, and you guys will only be calculating the F statistic for one way ANOVAs, so you don't have to worry about integration of multiple numbers of groups. Uh, but the between subject, or the not the between subject, the between group degrees of freedom is going to be calculated by taking the total number of groups that you have minus one. The within group sub or oh my god I'm doing it no no don't say that the within group comparison degrees of freedom is going to be the total number of subjects you have minus the number of groups that you've collected and then your total degrees of freedom will just be total number of subjects minus one so really if you know n and you know k you can calculate any of these um. I think in the quiz this week, I give you two of the degrees of freedom uh, measurements in the table, and then you have to use that information to figure out what the other degrees of freedom is. So if I gave you the total degrees of freedom as um, 59, you would be able to say, well, I know total degrees of freedom is n minus one. So if it's 59, add one to that and you get a total sample size of 60. If I also gave you the degrees of freedom up here, right? Similarly, if maybe I said degrees of freedom for between groups is two, then you say, okay, well two, you add one to that, that gives you K. And then you would be able to figure out this one, for example, right? So there's various ways that you can like manipulate uh, to figure out degrees of freedom, but just know I won't always directly give you N and I won't always directly give you K. But if you know how these expressions work, then you should be able to calculate one degrees of freedom if you know something about the other ones in the table. Okay. So these are kind of like the two foundational bits of information that we need to calculate the F statistic. From there, we calculate what's called the mean square. Um, and we do it for both between and within group comparisons. And the calculation is the same, it's just the row changes. So mean square is calculated by taking the sum of square value divided by the degrees of freedom. Okay, so for between group comparisons, we would just do sum of squares of between groups divided by degrees of freedom of between groups. For mean square for within groups, it would be sum of square divided by degrees of freedom for within groups. And then for the F statistic, we just take the ratio between the between group uh, mean square and the within group mean square. So it's a very systematic way of calculating things, which is kind of 
nice to remember. Um, but I, I let you guys know in the activity to reference back to this slide. So if you want to put a star or something next to it, um, it'll be helpful when you do your activity. Uh, yeah. Do I have any questions so far? I always make weird faces and awkward pauses, but I'll keep going. Um, I made this slide, I've already talked about everything on this slide with the exception of one thing so far, um, actually two things so far, um, but I just wanted to give you a, a nice comparison slide if the decision tree didn't make sense and the flow chart didn't hit the concept home. The primary difference between a one-way and a two-way ANOVA is the number of independent variables. One way has one, two way has two, yay, okay. The way that we name our, our tests can vary. Um, one way ANOVAs, they're actually referred to as one way ANOVAs in SPSS. I like you guys to add in the independent component in between like one way independent ANOVA and a two way independent ANOVA. So that way we have a distinction between independent and repeated measures ANOVAs. Um, one-way ANOVAs or one-way independent ANOVAs are also referred to as simple one-way ANOVAs. Um, there's not much variation past that that I have been exposed to. Um, but again, the primary goal is to look at the differences between groups of one independent variable. For two-way ANOVAs, our naming conventions get a little bit crazy. Um, so there's two primary things that you need to have when you're naming your ANOVA. One being how many variables you're working with. So it should either have two-way inserted in there or you have uh, a level by level reference, which I'll give you guys an example of this when we look at the two-way SPSS ANOVA PowerPoint. Um, but as long as you have some reference to how many variables are being looked at, and then the types of samples that you've collected. So we could either say we have between between um, or an independent ANOVA, that would suffice. Between between just means that each of the levels, or no, sorry, each of the independent variables that you've collected are between subject factors. So when we get to repeated measure two-way ANOVAs, it would be a within, within. If we have a mixed factor ANOVA, it would be a between, within. So you can kind of see how those words kind of work um, when you're naming your ANOVA. But there are several ways that are considered correct uh, if you're naming your test um, in your activity. Okay. Um, we're not going to do namings for this week or next week, just because this is the only naming convention that you're really using, but it's a good thing to kind of think about um, as you keep going. Uh, quickly addressing question in the chat. Yes, we are going to test for assumptions, and I think that's on the next slide. Um, but for two-way ANOVA, we're kind of expanding this concept here where we're not only interested in looking at the effects of a single independent variable, but we're looking at the effects of two independent variables. Um, and the comparisons that we get in SPSS will look at all of our groups of independent variable one without any impact of independent variable two. We do the reverse for that, for independent variable two, and then we can look at the interaction between both of those. And I feel like this, I can, I can keep repeating this concept over and over again in the, in the lecture, which I do, um, but it won't probably hit home until you actually have a tangible example to work with in the activity. So there's a lot of different ways that I've worded it within the PowerPoint. So hopefully one of them works eventually, um, but essentially one way ANOVAs have one main effect, two way ANOVAs have three main effects that you're interested in. For the assumptions, because Lori Joe is on top of it, um, this is what we have. They're the exact same assumptions that we had for independent t-tests. 
The only exception is how many independent variables you have. Um, and then the levels or the minimum number of levels that you're supposed to have, because um, that's the main difference between ANOVAs and TTAs. But we still have random sampling. We're still going to make sure we have a normal distribution with no significant outliers for the dependent variable for each independent variable group. So if we had both males and females, we would have to look at normality in males separate from females. So this is similar to some procedures that we did at the beginning of this semester uh, when we did like the split file command in SPSS, if you guys remember that. Um, we have a single ind or single dependent variable, that's ratio or interval data. And then our independent variable characteristics will depend on which type of ANOVA we're running. So uh, for one-way ANOVAs, it would be one between subject factor with at least three levels. For a two-way ANOVA, we would assume that we have two between subject factors with at least two levels for each of those variables. We're bringing back the homogeneity of variance assumption. So that's nice because you guys are already familiar with it. Um, we still use Levine's test to look at it. And um, the only thing that's different, well, I, I mean, I guess it kind of depends on how you're used to naming or listing your null hypothesis. Um, but really, we're just adding another group, right? Because we add another level uh, in comparison to independent t tests. So instead of equal variances between two groups, we're going to have equal variances between three or more groups. Uh, as a side note to the homogeneity of variance, it's a little bit different between a one-way ANOVA output and a two-way ANOVA output. Um, the primary reason we have a difference is because there are limitations in SPSS for two-way ANOVAs. For any case very similar to like the last exam, if you violate an assumption, the most I'm going to ask you is just to say if it's met or violated, and then you keep going on with the analysis as, as we discuss in class. That way you still get the experience of like going through the process. Um, but it is good to have examples of when you have a violation so you know what it looks like. Uh, for one-way ANOVAs, if we meet the assumption, it's when we have a p-value greater than 0.05, because that means we accept the null that we have equal variances. If this is the case, the ANOVA table is where you go for the p-value for your main effect. If you violate homogeneity of variance, you would actually read a different table, which um, we call Welch's test. Um, essentially, the, the interpretation of the p-value in the ANOVA table and the Welch's table are the same, um, but the, the p-values might not always be the same because the Welch's test applies the degrees of freedom correction factor. So um, we'll, we'll revisit this concept when we go through the SPSS procedures. Um, but just so you kind of get a, a forewarning, ANOVAs are, are stupid. I will, I will say that. <laughs> Outputs get a little crazy, and it's very much of a flow chart type of thinking process. Like, did I violate or did I meet? If yes, go this direction. If no, go this direction. Did I violate or meet? <laughs> or did I do I reject or uh, accept the null? If yes, go this way. If no, go this way. But it's different for different tables. So um, I have flowcharts posted already for ANOVAs. If they're helpful to you, please use them. Um, but I also set up notes very similar to flowchart type thinking. So this could also be helpful. Um, but one-way ANOVAs kind of have the equal variances assumed output versus equal variances not assumed kind of built into the test. For two-way ANOVAs, it's not the case. So um, when we meet the assumption of homogeneity of variance, we just go straight to the ANOVA table, no big deal. If we violate it, that's where things get a little tricky. Um, we don't have a Welch's test adjustment that's available for us to input into the test for a two-way ANOVA. So 
Therefore, if we uh, violate homogeneity variance, we don't have a way to correct it in SPSS automatically. Um, so usually what would happen is you would then reassess the samples that you collected. If your samples have relatively equal numbers of people and they're sufficiently large enough, um, so kind of think 30 or larger, and this, the largest group variance um, or the ratio between the largest group variance and smallest group variance is less than three. Typically, we would say if those things are true, the test, the ANOVA should be robust enough that your um, inequality of variances shouldn't affect your results. If this is not the case, then it's kind of like, oh, proceed with caution. You guys don't actually have to remember this or check it. I just want you to know. Um, because we do have inquisitive students in here. They're like, what happens if you violate it? <laughs> um, that this is essentially what happens. It's like, we can still accept our results, um, but for the purposes of this class, SPSS is limited and we just kind of have to deal with that. Okay, questions before I start going into hypothesis testing or main effect stuff? Huh. One, I can always count on you for questions. Let's go. Um, so we look at the group with the largest variance. Yes. If like, I don't require you guys to look at this, but I know um, several students from past semesters like always come back to save PowerPoints. Um, so I just put it in there kind of like for that reason. If you end up doing statistics. Um, <laughs> But yeah, you would take like, let's say we had three groups. You would take the ratio with the group who has like the largest standard deviation, um, divide that by the group with the smallest standard deviation. And if the quotient of that division is less than three, then um, you could assume that your variances are not too far separated. Um, in such a way that they would negatively impact the results of your ANOVA, if that makes sense. But for any case, when we violate Levine's test in a two-way ANOVA, we're just going to say, oops, it's violated, and then just keep reading the ANOVA table. Um, so yeah. Another question. We are using equal instead of not equal uh, for the null hypothesis. Got it. I was like, hmm? um, yeah. So the null hypothesis is always going to argue there are equal variances. Kind of similar to when we look at the differences between means and null hypothesis says the means are equal. So it's just saying there's no, no significant differences between the variances of each group. So. If you've met the assumption, equal variances, bless you. If, if, <laughs> if we have violated it, then no, no equal variances. Okay. Um, bless you. <laughs> okay. Uh, good times. All right. Um, for null hypothesis, uh, or hypothesis testing, I apologize in advance. You guys are going to hate me this week. There are a lot of p-values to keep track of in ANOVAs. Just fair warning. I want you guys to centralize your focus on these slides, though. Okay. So notice I put main effect. Uh, when I ask you guys, what's the p-value for the main effect of the ANOVA? This is the slide you should refer to, okay? Um, because this is primarily like the, the main reason we run the ANOVA. The main effect will tell you what the difference is between the three levels, or if we have three or more levels, it tells you what the difference is between the groups of the independent variable that you measured, okay? So our class, we always do non-directional hypotheses. Um, so that's just kind of an assumption you'll make when you run all of the ANOVAs in this class. But the null hypothesis, very, very similar to an independent t-test. Again, the only thing we're changing is we're adding another group mean 
uh, in our evaluation. So we're still going to say the null hypothesis argues that the independent variable has no significant effect on the dependent variable. Um, or we could also write it as the mean of group one, group two, group three, and so on and so forth. If you have more groups are all equal to each other. Okay. Research hypothesis would argue the exact opposite saying that the means are not equal to each other. Um, and specifically, if, if we have this scenario, um, there's a certain way that we will word that, um, which I actually give you in the next slide. So just think no significant effect on the dependent variable. That is our null hypothesis. Um, when we determine if we have statistical significance, we're still looking at exact p-values that SPSS gives us. Um, and the way that we interpret the p-values is the same as the entire semester, right? So if the probability or the p-value that you, you calculate in SPSS is greater than the alpha level you set, for all of our ANOVAs, this will be 0.05, okay? Uh, so if the probability of error is larger than the error that you set at the beginning of your test, then we accept the null, right? We'll say our intervention either didn't work or we had some study design flaws. So we can't say that the reason there are differences, if any, between our groups, um, we can't necessarily say that's due to the intervention because we potentially might have more error or the intervention just didn't do anything, okay? Um, so P greater than alpha, except the null, and then we say independent variable has no significant effect on the dependent variable. If, however, and I put an asterisk next to this, um, this option for a reason, um, if you have a p-value that's less than 0.05 or less than your alpha, you reject the null hypothesis. And then the way that we word this is there's at least one significant difference between two groups. And the reason there is at least one um, is because you have three means now, or three or more. I'm just going to keep saying three because it's that's the minimum requirement, right? But you're saying you have at least one difference between any given pairing between each of your groups. So when we have a significant p-value for our main effect, and we say um, independent variable has a significant effect on the dependent variable, we have to consult post hoc tests, um, which are also often called pairwise comparisons. They're referred to as both in SPSS, so anytime I write them, I just write them together. Um, but we have to consult post hoc tests to figure out where the significant differences are between the groups that we've measured. So that looks something like, oh no, oh no, go back one. There we go. PowerPoint, don't do this. Okay. I think it's fine. So again, if P is less than alpha, we have to look at post hoc tests. Basically, the way that these are run is just like t tests, where we say, let's take two of our groups and their means, and then we compare those means together and then see, is there a difference between the two of them? The reason they're called post hoc tests and we don't run individual t tests is because um, that introduces more type one error. So a lot of people are like, why do you make an, uh, another test if we could just jump to doing, you know, like group pairs if from the beginning, right? Um, and this is why, is too much type one error and then you don't actually know if the intervention, if your results are due to the intervention. So we do ANOVAs and then we have post hoc tests, which basically do the same thing as t-tests, but they help us to minimize type one error. So the way that you can think about like the interpretations of the post hoc tests are very similar to t-tests though, so if that helps. Um, and then I, I just, this is one of the extra memes. Who doesn't love Ryan Gosling? Um, but hey girl, let me run a post hoc test on your one way ANOVA. I don't know. 
I look, I googled uh, one way ANOVA means, and I thought that was funny. <laughs> Anyways, what the post hoc tests do, uh, like I gave you guys an example, if there's three levels of the independent variable, if you have four, you kind of just go through the same process. You just have more pairs than what I have listed here. Um, but if there's three levels, we're essentially looking at the difference between level one and level two, level two and level three, and level one and level three. So that's what my numbers in this scenario mean is like not different independent variables, but different levels of the same variable. Um, and pretty much what we'd say is like the null hypothesis would argue that the means are equal. Research hypothesis argue that the means are not equal. Okay. Um, so Juan asked a question. This is why we say at least one significant difference. Yes, because the p-value for the main effect of your ANOVA could come out as less than 0.05. Um, and then maybe you only have the pair between level one and level two is significant but the pairs between level two and three and levels one and three are not significant. You could have a case where all of them are significant um, or they're all significantly different from each other. You could have a case where you have two significantly different ones, but one that's not significantly different. So uh, yeah, that's essentially why the interpretation of the main effect, if you have less than alpha, you usually say there's at least one significant difference between um, your independent variable groups. Um, and then post hoc tests will tell you where the differences exist. Good question. Okay. Um, but then there's more p values. <laughs> Yay! All right. So, keeping track of our p values so far for one way ANOVAs, we have p value for the main effect. And then you're going to have one p value for each of the pairwise comparisons. Okay. So, that technically in this example, we would have a p-value attached to each one of those pairs. Um, but that tells you uh, if there is a significant difference between the levels you're comparing or not. Again, the way we interpret this is very similar to how you would write the interpretation for a t-test. So, because you're only looking at the comparison between two means. Um, usually the way that I ask you guys this in the activities is like list the significant pairs. And then you would just list the pairs that have p-values that are less than 0.05. Um, and I go through different examples of that in the activity videos, so I won't spend too much time on it here. Uh, questions on one-way ANOVAs? Guys, a second if you're typing. Coffee break. I'll keep my eye on the chat box, but I don't hear any objections so far. Okay, two way independent ANOVAs. Again, this slide and the next slide, if you wanna put stars next to them, these are the ones you refer back to for the main effects of the uh, two way independent ANOVA, okay? So when we have a two way ANOVA, we've already said multiple times, you have two independent variables. So we need to look at the main effect for the first independent variable, the main effect for the second independent variable, and the interaction effect between the two independent variables. Um, we're gonna Bob Ross it and we're gonna say, let's get crazy. I don't know if any of you ever watched his show, but he's just it's like this sweet man who says, let's get crazy. Um, this is where we get crazy. So the main effect for independent variable A and B are interpreted the exact same way as you would a one-way ANOVA. The only difference is that when we have um, each independent variable, we're looking at just that group comparison. So let's say we have um, gender, uh, so male, female, or sex, if we're being technical, technical with terms. So we have males versus females. And then maybe we want to see if there are differences um, in some dependent variable measure between sports. And we choose uh, basketball, soccer, and football. 
well, basketball, soccer, and let's say, what's another sport? I'm not a sport person. Let's say baseball, baseball, softball. Okay. So we take three sports that both males and females um, competitively play in most of the time. I wish females played football more, but that's okay. Um, anyways, three sports. Okay, so that, that's an independent variable or a between subject independent variable because each of our uh, groups is independent of the other. And then we have males and females, which is a two level. So three level independent variable, two level independent variable. When we look at the main effects, what we would say is for let's say sex is our independent variable A, we look at the differences between males and females regardless of what sport they play. So we kind of just take whatever the dependent variable measure is and we say all of our female measures and all of our male measures, are they different from each other or are they not? So that's what this effect would look at. The next main effect would be for sport. So then we would say, what are the differences between all people, doesn't matter what their sex is, right? Are, are there differences between basketball, soccer, and baseball slash softball? Okay, um, so each of these main effects is just clumping people based on the groups or they're, they're based off of the levels for that independent variable only, regardless of what their grouping is for the other independent variable. Um, there are better examples of this once we get into the outputs, but just so you have an idea. Uh, the notations that I'm using down here a is indicating the variable of like the independent variable. The numbers are indicating the level. So just if you're referencing this, that's what those mean. Um, so those are the main effects for each independent variable. And then the interaction effect is going to be between the two independent variables. And I didn't have enough room, so I put it on the next slide. Um, but the null hypothesis for this is that the independent variable has no significant interaction with, uh, or independent variable A has no significant interaction with independent variable B. So for our example that we're working through, uh, gender or sex has no significant interaction with sport or whatever our dependent variable is. Um, and then when we look at the differences of our interactions, we can further split this up by looking at levels of independent variable A within levels of independent variable B, or we can look at differences of independent variable B within levels of independent variable A. And I'm just throwing a bunch of letters at you guys and you're probably crying because it's too much. Um, sorry, there was a lag. <laughs> But I want to explain how I notated this um, PowerPoint. Don't be dumb. Don't do this. Not today. OK, there we go. Um, I've separated each grouping comparison with a red and or ampersand sign. So that kind of helps you distinguish. I've also written these in a table format um, a few slides from now. So that might also help with the visualization. But if we're looking at levels of independent variable A within levels of independent variable B, we're saying for all levels of B1, and I have the example I gave you guys only have two levels for sex. So we would technically like chop off one of these for that um, if we continue with that analogy. But um, basically we would say, what is the difference between males and females? So that's my independent variable A within a certain sport. So then I can say within basketball, are males and females significantly different from each other? Or within soccer, or are they significantly different from each other? Or within, what was it, baseball or, volley, or baseball or softball, right? Are they significantly different from each other? And now I don't know if I've even been using the same sports, but I'm trying to stay on track. Anyways, you can look at differences between sex within the sport, or we can flip that and say within all females, are there differences between the sports? Or within all males, are there differences between the sports? 
Um, so this is where we start getting crazy with the p-values <laughs> because um, we're technically just going to have three p-values reported, one for main effect of independent variable A, one for the main effect of independent variable B, and then one for the interaction effect. But if any of those um, main effects are significant, then we look at pairwise comparisons or post hoc tests. So uh, technically, you're going to have three p values for the main effects of a two way ANOVA. And then there's a question in the chat. You're taking the level of groups and comparing them to each independent level. Yeah, essentially. I have a better example of this on a couple slides from now. And then we'll also have an actual example with the outputs. So hopefully that will help um, visualize that better than here. Uh, but essentially, yes. Okay. So now let's go through the p values for each of the main effects. Again, three main effects that we're looking at for a two way ANOVA. Um, for main effect, of independent variable A, this will come directly from the ANOVA table. Um, if P is greater than alpha, that independent variable has no significant effect on the dependent variable. If P is less than alpha, there's at least one significant difference between the groups of that variable. So then we would do a post hoc test. This is literally exactly the same as one way ANOVAs. So when you, when you look at the main effects of independent variables separately, right, or just this one versus the second one, it's exactly the same as a one-way ANOVA procedure, okay? Um, so we'll have our pairwise comparisons, and then we can say, oh, if P is greater than alpha, it's not a significant pair. If P is less than alpha, we do have a significant pair, and then we move on with our life, okay? So that's for main effect A. We would do this exact same process for the main effect of independent variable B, right? Um, we would just look at a different section of our output for the pairwise comparisons if and only if we have a significant main effect, okay? That's why I keep putting asterisks here. I don't know if you guys pick up on symbol hints. Um, symbol hints, there we go, uh, in the PowerPoints, but those two are attached to each other. You only look at post hocs if you have a significant main effect. If you don't have a significant main effect, chuck the post hocs out of your head and you don't have to worry about them, okay? Um, and then we would evaluate the, the p-values for all of our post hocs, again, the same way that we did with our main effect of independent variable A. So the, the interpretation and the analysis of each of the independent variables separate from one another are going to be the exact same process. The interaction effect is where things get a little bit nuts. So I've created a table that is, for the most part, the same setup as what you would see in SPSS. Um, but I, I have more information. So. Uh, if we're looking at the interaction of independent variable A within the levels of independent variable B, right, we're looking at the comparisons of our groupings of levels of A. So for my example, it was males versus females. So technically we'd only have two, where's my mouse? There we go. We only have two comparisons. It would, in SPSS, it would say males compared to females, females compared to males because um, it's redundant and it's kind of dumb sometimes. But um, we're looking at, are there differences between sexes within a certain level of our other independent variable B, which in our example was sports. Okay. So if you have, again, if and only if you have a significant interaction effect, that's when you would look at the post hoc test. Um, and then I've kind of separated out the null hypotheses for each type of comparison of each possible pairing of the levels of independent variable A within the levels of independent variable B. We then would also do 
the comparison of levels of B within levels of A. So that's where we get this last slide. I, I do like you guys. I, I'm not doing this because you're being punished. It's just statistics. <laughs> so uh, the table would be the same. You just switch the A and B columns. Okay. So instead of looking at the difference between males and females within a given sport, now we're looking at the differences between uh, sports within males or females. And because my example only has two levels. Technically, in this table, this bottom row wouldn't exist. Okay, so the numbers of rows and columns that you, well, the numbers of rows that you have are going to be dependent on the number of levels that you're comparing. So that will change, but in general, this was an example set if you had three levels of each independent variable. Um, so that's something to go off of. Um, and my last meme for the week is uh, this, when you finally understand ANOVA and then factorial ANOVA is introduced, um, you can see it incrementally gets very more complicated. So sorry about that. But uh, yeah, are there any questions? Okay, I'll let you rest and digest that for about five minutes. Take a break, get something to drink, something to eat, go to the bathroom. Um, and then what time is it? We'll come back at five o'clock, five o'clock-ish, 5.01, if you wanna be specific. Um, and then we'll go through the SPSS procedures. I don't think that one should take too long, um, but we'll go through those quickly and then we'll be done for the day. So feel free to, Take a step away and come back at five approximately. And then if anyone has questions, you can feel free to enter them in the chat now if you want to, but no obligations. <laughs> 